Hello and welcome to Calorama Information's webinar on the state of the IVD industry. I am Bruce Carlson, publisher of Calorama Information, and I am joined today by Emil Salazar, our IVD market analyst and the author of Studies in Infectious Disease Diagnostic Testing Markets, United States Diagnostics Markets, Molecular Point of Care, Proteomics, among other studies. Calorama Information is a healthcare only market research firm. And we have a specialty in biotech and in vitro diagnostics. Today we will be presenting our global IVD market estimate. It will be general at first and then diving deeper into a few topic areas. At the end, we'll take some questions where time allows. This presentation will be available afterwards to attendees to download. So we base our webinar today on our published studies in our library and from our visit to the American Association of Clinical Chemistry in Philadelphia this year where we conducted major vendor consults and primary research. And uh, we were hosted by the AACC, if you will, as a member of the press and we thank them for allowing us to be there and to cover that event on our Twitter and in our reports. At the end of this webinar, uh, we'll be taking some questions, as we say. Um, the information that we cover today is also based on our 10th, or you might say, the silver anniversary edition of our worldwide market for in vitro diagnostic tests. Now, when we say the report is the Bible of the IVD industry, I hope you'll understand that that is from a customer quote to us. We don't believe it's too much hyperbole. Uh, it is both a well-used source of independent research for your benchmarking, for your business planning. It's also comprehensive in that it covers the whole world market. It covers all of the test segments. It's 1,600 pages. It considers competition, clinical regulatory trends, the historical situation in its analysis, and something else. This report profiles hundreds of companies with detail, their revenues, merger and acquisition activity, product launches, segment participation of large movers and fast growers, and enough information on hundreds of mid to small concerns that may be among your business partners or competitors in the future. Now, when you consider all the time savings of, of the work that's been done for you in terms of benchmarking and considering competition and researching other companies, we think it's a valuable investment. So what we discussed today is based on this report. But it goes without saying that there's more weighty discussion in the report. And it's available on our website at caloramainformation.com. Now, it'll probably sound a little bit like the airline here when they say this is an extremely full flight. The confirmed audience for this webinar exceeds 150 people. And there are attendees from several continents in the world. And we're happy about that. We know your time's valuable, and we thank you for investing your time. We're pleased with the reaction that we received for this webinar, but I have to say we're not entirely surprised by it. We think it indicates the interest and activity in in vitro diagnostics today. And if we were to ask why this interest is happening, we think there's a very positive long-term foundation for IVD product sales. You start with this fact. 70% of healthcare decisions are made with the aid of a clinical test. Now, as a member of the industry, you have every right to feel some pride that you are participating in the piece of healthcare that many view as the best hope of advancing progress in fighting disease. Often, the greater public attention is on pharmaceutical treatments. But we believe the story of IVD's contribution can only get out more. And Calorum Information is committed, in addition to our principal purpose of providing quality market research to using our publicity efforts, as other IVD organizations will as well, to spread the message to the public at large. Now, but whether that 70% statistic becomes household knowledge one day, and we hope it will, the fact remains, 
most clinical decisions originate with a test, and that's a good position to be in. Secondly, the global aging of the population cannot be ignored, and it plays right into IVD test markets. 612 million people in the world are 65 years or older right now. That will grow to almost 900 million people in 10 years. Another way to look at what this means, in 1995, Italy became the first country where seniors outnumbered children. They're no longer alone. Japan joined the list in 2000, Sweden, the Netherlands in 2015, more seniors than children. The United States will join the club in 10 years. So global aging is the most fundamental reality that will increase the stakes of disease detection and certainly the volume of the need. Thirdly, the promise of big data we think presents a highly likely long-term boost to testing. I mean, we may not know the form it's all going to take yet. There are experiments with Kaiser and Aetna mining their databases, along with some PBMs, other entities mining their databases. This can only enrich IBD long-term. And that's why you see continued investor interest and media interest in IVD market. With this long-term foundation, it should be no surprise that we project a growing market. So here is our IVD market estimate and forecast. Now, this is FDA-approved kits, tests, instruments, reagents. It is 60.5 billion in 2016. It will grow to 72.8 billion in 2021. That's 3.5% growth. If you have a previous edition of our report, the eighth that was published in 2012, or the ninth edition that was published in 2014, you'll notice that we've lowered our growth estimate. Since the 2014 edition, about five ticks, from 4% to 3.5%. There's a number of reasons for that. You start with traditional core markets. Some of them are under strain. Uh, take glucose. It's a, you, I mean, you have to start there. It's a tenth of the market. There's been Medicare glucose price cutting in the U.S., reimbursement cuts in Europe. And this on top of the entry of lower cost products thinning branded major market sales. So uh, challenges there. And that's not the only category. An expected decrease in pap smears performed in the U.S. and Europe, a decrease in reimbursement for pathology tests in the U.S. Another strain is the migration of previous previously low-volume tests on independent analyzers to larger panels. You're talking about procalcitonin, you're talking about D-dimer, vitamin D, HbA1c, several others now in integrated analyzers. That will erode price. Will also erode price is lab consolidation in the U.S., and there's no end to that trend. So these are your growth limiters that made us a little cautious. And that being said, let's not dwell on the market negatives here. Demand drivers outweigh limiters, and we expect forward progress in the consolidated market growth of 3.5% next five years. So all of those factors that will boost the aforementioned aging population, the continued scourges of cancer and infectious disease, needing testing, better POC. Emil Salazar is going to topic in a bit, increased availability of health care insurance in emerging nations, which is going to provide the financing for those, uh, for those health care transactions. Two columns on a page do not tell the whole story, and there are winners and losers within the collective growth that we're talking about. If you look at the next slide, you'll see that revenue growth is commensurate with uh, commensurate to test segmentation. So CTC testing, circular tumor, circulating tumor cell testing, uh, molecular HPV testing, that's going to grow at a faster rate than the aggregate, where your ClinChem is going to grow at a slower rate. And mature molecular segments, or IDAST, will be about average. 
I mean, specific growth rates are covered in our worldwide market for in vitro diagnostic tests, the 10th edition study, in considerable detail with scores of test segments covered. Who's earning these revenues? The IVD market share picture, it's not surprising, but it is worthy of commentary. Roche Diagnostics is number one, and they lead the market by five or six billion dollars. I mean, no one is close. So that's the situation at the number one spot. And yet we should not think of Roche's diagnostics, uh, Roche Diagnostics position as a stagnant one. They stay active in most markets in our industry. They develop ClinCam solutions, hematology, molecular, POC. So they are a dynamic leading company and uh, not just kind of the big person at the top. Um, I'm reminded of a famous business tale that took place in 1985 at the Sears Tower, which is the headquarters at that time of the gigantic U.S. retail chain. Here, a group of nervous store managers went into the Sears Tower for a meeting, the headquarters, and told their managers, the company management, about a threat from this new company called Walmart. It's eating up share in our regions. And they were told to go back and run their stores better. We are Sears, gentlemen. Run your stores better and stop being afraid. <laughs> That's a classic story. But it is not the way to look at Roche. It's not the way to look at the market position here. Roche is constantly moving. They stay active in all the segments they can. They seek out growth. They do not wish to seed ground at the margins. You see them boosting their molecular offering with the gene weave acquisition last year, providing them entry into antibiotic susceptibility testing and multi-drug resistant organism testing. You can see them developing their Cobus Leot molecular solution for flu and strep. Now that's going to play in smaller settings. Some of them, the, some of the new venues we're going to talk about, retail clinics, urgent care, and they're out there with that. So you see a company that's covering every significant market there. They hold number one. There's no reason to think otherwise, certainly not in the five years that we normally consider the scope of our study. Abbott Diagnostics is second, Siemens Health and Ears is third, but watch it because it is a close race between uh, those second and third market positions. Danaher, Beckman, Coulter is fourth. Watch Danaher, but really watch all of them, two, three, and four market positions. Abbott's making a huge effort to improve its oncology test menu and has been investing in new immunoassays and molecular tests histology. Siemens Health and Ear is uh, focusing on its molecular business after divesting the microscan microbiology panels. You see the partnership they've developed with Thermo Fisher Scientific to tie in their Thermo's real-time PCR system to Siemens Versant uh, case PCR molecular solution. Now, Dana Harris continued to signal that they'll acquire to grow. Now, the same with Abbott. You see, that you'll, we'll, we'll keep watching. There's no timely comment to make at this time about the Lear and Abbott situation, or even the Abbott and uh, St. Jude uh, intended acquisition, but keep an eye on it. And with smart partnerships, acquisitions, new products, watch the second, third, and fourth market share position over the coming years. Now, we must note that these four companies are 46% of the total IVD market for companies. And if you add 20 more companies, you have 88% of the market. But that being said, there is still plenty of opportunity for fast growth, second tier type companies, your Wacos, your Cepheid, your MindRay type companies to gain share or to be acquired by larger entities. And why is that? Well, because there is categorical variance in growth opportunity among the test segments. Here's a topographical chart that illustrates some of those differences in the growth, in the revenue growth expected over five years versus the aggregated market. So you can see where some of the 
opportunities lie. Now this shows relative growth rates only. Full statistics on scores of tests are in our 10th edition volume. This PowerPoint will be provided uh, after the webinar. You can download it so you can get a uh, inspect these differences closer. But it's the same with geographics. There are differences in the growth in test segments and difference in growth rate by country or region, all of which is going to affect the opportunity picture and open up different opportunities for different companies. Obviously, your developed market cones are showing flat to no growth. And the go-to places, not surprisingly, will be China, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Latin America. No news, same story if we were having this presentation several years ago, it's just more defined now. One sign of the continued interest in the IBD market is that merger and, ac and acquisition activity remains brisk. And our 10th edition records over 100 mergers and acquisitions between 2014 and 2016. And there's no end in sight. I mean, you see several recent and obviously Dana harris -Effied. We think all of this means better tests, stronger companies. The future of the industry lies in the development of better tests. That means more sensitive, faster, user-friendly, ID-capable, but no company, big or small, owns all of the technology needed to get there. So they'll have to get the pieces they do not have from partners, either through collaborations, of which there will be many, and are many now, and acquisitions. So you see Roche buying Abina, buying IQ, BioMariu buying Applied Maths to enlarge its bioinformatics offering. Thermo Fisher buys Ephemetrics. The Asorin buys Focus Diagnostics. Abbott OmniLab. Dana Hare Beckman Coulter picking up Microscan from Siemens. Diasorin buying uh, Focus, as we mentioned, Alir buying US Diagnostics. So expect this kind of merger activity to continue in the next 10 years. A significant trend is the proliferation of new venues for testing, including two that we have kept our eyes on at Calorama Information over the years, and we do have market research studies in both of these areas. Retail clinics, these are clinics that are not freestanding, housed within a retail setting, usually a drugstore, sometimes grocery. They grew 38% in the last five years. So this was a novelty concept when we first started covering it in 2007. And now it's a realistic target. And you do see IVD, major IVD companies talking about them. 38% growth last five years. Urgent care centers have, have been around for quite some time, but you also see growth there, maybe a little bit quieter, but you see growth there, especially since the Affordable Care Act was passed. And there's been a whole set of new urgent care clinics, and they're almost a segment to study and perhaps target in and of themselves. Well, we're going to do that later in the year with an urgent care report that will have a special focus on the new urgent care. You know, it's not so much about the small urgent care. And, and just for definitional purposes, an urgent care is one of those places that are, that are freestanding usually. It's not, it's not in a retail setting. It might be in a strip mall, but it has its own building. And uh, they, will, they will offer more services than a retail clinic. They'll offer x-rays. They'll offer... Uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll set uh, broken uh, limbs and, and the like. They, they, they'll do stitches in, in a lot of cases. So it's very different from where uh, retail clinics might be more for flu, cough, cold, is, is where they're getting vaccine shots, is where they're getting their, their big uh, market from. So urgent care centers are growing, and later in the year we're going to study them again with a with a greater focus on some of those newly open centers like you know since 2009 are they staying open are they getting the traffic so it's not so much about the urgent care center that's been around for 20 years but it's about the one that opened across the street look out for that 
No market assessment can be wholly positive, and there are some areas for concern. Thus are three trends that should worry IVD manufacturers. First of all, flat European growth, growth um, revenue growth has to be concerning, slow to know. German, Irish, French, Spanish, all those IVD markets saw recent declines. Slight declines, but recent declines. And agencies have reduced reimbursements in response. I mean, Europe is a quarter of the IVD market, so this has to be concerning, especially as China's growth rate, while still high, goes from emerging nation, say, to what we might call emerged nation growth rate, and other emerging nation growth rates aren't where they used to be forecasted. So it's going to be necessary for companies to get creative to make up for what's going on in Europe, something to be concerned. Secondly, the innovation gap between product development and healthcare regulation and finance just has to be worrying. New technology is developed all the time, and the industry depends on that innovation, but it doesn't mean that regulators and payers are keeping up. The development of IVD product choices enhances medicine, but also puts healthcare systems in a quandary. The population is aging, and we can't expect that all governments will simply welcome this with new reimbursements and new funding. Cost efficiency imperatives pressure payers, and as a result, healthcare organizations have developed strict cost performance and care guideline directives. So IVD markets will have to prove with scientific data, data, and more data. IVD makers just can't expect that every test will be approved on its mechanical performance alone. Emil Salazar will speak more to this later. So we think the trend of the healthcare in the home is of course exciting for the public at large and, and, and probably a reality that is coming our way, but IVD companies are used to providing products for the hospital, lab, clinic, physician office, so the home is where healthcare is going but it simply raises new questions of operability, communication, liability, insurance. Will IVD companies be ready? There are some other trends to consider. The evolving role of sequencing, and that's a big topic, one that could be an entire webinar. Emil will speak to some of the developments in NGS going on in the United States versus other countries. We have recently published a next generation sequencing markets report that details the entry of this technology into the clinic. And that's available um, also at our site, kelleraminformation.com. So big topic, one to keep an eye on, too much for, for today. IT is an inseparable part of testing now. I mean, tests must speak to the EMR, they must use information technology to insist with, with interpretation. You see big names in information technology, IBM, Apple, Google, Dell. They're making their mark in transforming crude test results into actionable medical information. Connection of IT to IVD is no longer novelty, but essential. I mean, this stems from everything from the data collection on a point of care test, smartphone applications, all the way up the chain to the use of big data. And you take a look at the IBM Watson system, the unit course gained fame by beating contestants on the television quiz show Jeopardy. Now it's entering our industry and Watson technology can process information similar to the way people think. It can, as a medical device and diagnostics industry article headline read, it can argue with your doctor. Maybe it's better that Watson doesn't argue with your doctor, but how it manifests itself will be seen in the coming year. I mean, the, the point is this. A computer doctor like Watson could change the way you might view big data and how it's going to reach us. If you think of big data as kind of an amorphous concept, there's all these transactions and it's not humanly possible to really aggregate them, so it's not coming our way. Well, I think this is where a computer doctor concept like Watson gives you a window for how you might actually use all that data that's being collected 
and realistically see the coming informational world in IVD. A third trend to keep an eye on is consolidation and decentralization. And these were often thought to be two different trends. And the question really in our industry was which one would win out? Would tests be decentralized or would consolidation force testing into the same large venues? But it's those two trends are manifesting themselves in an interesting way. And uh, something we've noticed this year, to speak to that, I'm going to ask Emil Salazar, our IBD market analyst, to comment on that. Hello, everyone. This is Emil Salazar. Uh, over the next couple of slides, I'll be discussing several trends in the IBD market, along with some of the relevant findings from our recent reports. So at the AACC Expo in Philadelphia this year, we noticed major IVD vendors were putting an even greater emphasis upon the core lab, or those high volume clinical tests, such as clinical chemistry, and immunoassays. At previous expos, we saw relatively more headline promotion of molecular diagnostics and other products in more traditionally thought of high growth markets. You can always expect the booths of top tier IVD companies at the conference to be organized around their core lab stations, their integrated workflow demonstrations, but the Core Lab also took the spotlight in terms of product introductions during the conference, uh, especially products that target the consolidation trends we believe is evident in lab testing and healthcare in general. Uh, a few examples. For Siemens Healthcare, a company undergoing a major branding effort, they used the conference to unveil their Atelica solution for automated, automated core lab testing. Atelica is an immunoassay clinical chemistry solution and it uses bidirectional magnetic sample conveyance to improve the speeds between analyzers. It's additionally compatible with the company's Optio automation that integrates sample handling for more than 30 types of samples. Workflow automation was also highlighted in the Roche booth with its COBOS 8100 configuration that handled pre-analytical through post-analytical sample processing. Speaking to orthoclinical diagnostics, uh, a company, of course, heavily involved in core lab testing discipline. In clinical chemistry, the company is going to be seeking out mid-volume labs, uh, including hospital labs and other smaller clinical labs. Uh, including those in emerging markets. And these second tier targets have been a common area for business development among IBD companies in recent years. For Ortho, it's going to be targeted through its upcoming Vitros XT3400 system. Other examples in clinical chemistry include the Sekisui SK500 and Randox Labs, RX Daytona Plus. For immunoassays, Diasorin is a notable example of a company that's also looking to carve out market space in the U.S. Uh, within hospital labs. And there it will be addressing the market with a flexible mid to high capacity system in the Liaison XL. So what to make of this new emphasis upon the core lab, an area that beforehand was a source of low growth, especially in the U.S. market. Well, expectations were low. Uh, you look at segments such as clinical chemistry, immunoassays, uh, even urinalysis and hematology. Those were segments that were hard hit in the years following the recession, uh, the years 2010 to 2013. Um, in developed markets, the expectations were relatively low at 1 to 2% growth annually. 
But since then, in reviewing IBD financials for several core lab leaders, lab spending did seem to pick up in 2014 within these segments. And we'd attribute that to labs planning and handling of increased patient volumes and higher patient utilization of healthcare, particularly outpatient healthcare services following the Affordable Care Act. Preliminary data from insurance carriers indicate that patient utilization of outpatient healthcare services increased by over 5% in 2015 as well as year-to-date in 2016. U.S. lab investment in core lab and improved automation, uh, we believe, is also in anticipation of the implementation of the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, or PAMA. With PAMA, Medicare reimbursement rates for lab tests will be market-based. Medicare schedule rates will reflect the average rates that are paid by private payers to large labs and hospital lab businesses. In turn, PAMA may drive down the market prices that private insurers are willing to pay for routine tests um, if they are used as a reference rate during negotiations. So the result is even mid-level labs, especially those in hospitals, will be looking to increase automation and investment in new analyzers across their workflows in order to remain profitable during continued pricing pressures. The higher spending in lab growth uh, and core lab uh, spending was in fact also a result of consolidation both in the U.S. lab industry and healthcare in general. The consolidation in the lab industry took the form of hospital acquisitions of physician practices and networks consolidation in the independent lab industry, and even independence acquisition or operation of hospital outreach businesses. With the implementation of PAMA, routine and high volume tests can be expected in certain areas to be withdrawn from smaller labs if the same capabilities are available in a larger network or contracted lab. And the larger labs, in turn, will need to expand their capacity to accommodate additional patient samples. If you review the chart on this slide, you'll see that we tracked a noticeable surge in market growth during the years of 2013 to 2015. But we believe in the coming years that the U.S. market in these segments will settle back to its previous year-over-year -year growth rates as the year-over-year -year effects of the Affordable Care Act begin to taper and utilization rates become more stable. At the other end of the spectrum from consolidation, even as some tests are increasingly centralized in their performance, decentralization has also been evident. And by decentralization, I'm referring to near-patient tests uh, also related as point-of-care tests. And this trend has been playing out in select test areas. Looking at this CLIA database managed by CMS, there's been an evident shift in POLs or physician office labs. More and more POLs perform only CLIA wave testing and increasingly fewer are certified to perform high or even moderate complexity testing. Among remaining non-POL sites of testing, CLIA wave sites are also growing, and we can see a similar decline in the number of accredited and compliant labs that are able to perform more complex testing. And new technology has been a major reason for this proliferation in CLIA wave sites. It's also been the critical enabling factor behind the decentralization of certain tests or the feasibility of their performance outside of a clinical lab. CLIA wave tests are increasingly available, we believe primarily due to improvements in microfluidics that's featured in test cartridges or integrated cartridges, and also improvements to the detection technologies. These are improvements both in terms of test precision and cost.
also critical behind CLIA WAVE devices, uh, especially the instrument platforms that are coming to market now, are the instrument software and user interfaces that make the devices more user friendly and critically for CLIA WAVE performance reduce the risk of user error. Near patient tests, uh, POC tests, especially those with unique reimbursement codes we believe can continue to be profitable in decentralized settings. Still, not all tests will be supported outside of the clinical lab. The tests that are more likely to succeed at near patient sites or at the point of care include rapid infectious disease tests, lipid panels, cardiac markers, glucose, and coagulation. All are heavily involved both in primary or outpatient care as well as rapid testing in hospitals. Um, all these categories are also featured now in home tests, including infectious disease tests with the introduction of over-the-counter HIV tests. Going forward, the IVD industry needs to recognize where decentralized test menus and POC products will be supported and where they can't be. For reimbursement, tests must demonstrate their clinical utility or value in healthcare when they're performed near patient or in a decentralized setting instead of being sent out. Moving now to one of the most high profile IVD market areas where decentralization is playing out is molecular point of care diagnostics. This market is characterized by several of the factors we've mentioned. New technologies and device design, the increasing availability of CLIA wave tests, and decentralization and performance that is supported by the utility of certain tests when they are performed near patient or at the point of care. There are certainly high hopes in the IVD industry for molecular POC. And we do project the market to grow tremendously through 2020. Its current size in this year, we estimate around 100 million. In our published report from uh, earlier, we pegged the sales in 2015 globally at approximately 75 million. The rapid development of molecular POC diagnostics uh, is preceded by a similar a trend that we saw with the successful penetration of molecular diagnostics into more routine performance in hospital labs. And this was a, a market that was developed and led by platforms such as the Becton Dickinson Max and of course the Cepheid Gene Expert System. But whereas highs or hospital acquired infections anchored the assay menus of the moderate complexity platforms that were introduced to hospital labs, respiratory infections are most common to the assay menus of molecular POC devices being introduced now. Under respiratory infections, the common tests are for flu, strep A, and respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. In terms of the addressable market by 2020, this, this would be a market size that was estimated or projected rather by the market currently served by rapid tests such as lateral flow amino assays or test strips. Respiratory infections are still only the second leading market opportunity for molecular POC diagnostics in terms of the total addressable market. Overall, the $4 billion market opportunity for molecular POC diagnostics in 2020 will be led by the segment we refer to as high burden diseases uh, in our parlance. This includes diseases that globally are foremost uh, HIV, common hepatitis viruses such as hep C and hep B, and tuberculosis. Outside of developed markets and in the countries hardest hit by these diseases, access to testing services remain poor. 
these markets are also known as resource poor regions or low income mark, uh, countries. And despite their potential or the total addressable market, they are not as likely to quickly develop as molecular POC platforms currently available remain cost prohibitive for routine use in these countries. There is still significant promise, uh, especially long term, as molecular POC diagnostics that would be offered in a mobile lab or remote clinic would offer unique capabilities that are above and beyond the current options for testing that are widely accessible in these countries. Looking at more specific applications in HIV, a molecular platform could allow for quantitative testing uh, at the point of care. That would allow for the monitoring of patients on antiretroviral therapies. Um, and this would be a test also referred to commonly as viral load monitoring. Antiretroviral therapies are a major goal of HIV AIDS campaigns led by NGOs. And the next phase in a lot of these is to move from detection of the disease to improving access to treatment would mitigate the role of transmission or mitigate the risk of transmission. Looking at tuberculosis, molecular testing is already available in larger labs in high burden countries, but accurate diagnosis is lacking at uh, smaller satellite labs and at near, pa near patient points of care. So while there's a high ceiling for these high burden diseases and molecular POC diagnostics, cost and distribution will remain significant challenges in the more near term market over the next four years. The third market application segment, molecular POC, is an area we refer to as women's health and sexually transmitted infections. And this is an area that has received uh, also a lot of attention from the industry in terms of assay development on molecular POC platforms. These are diseases, uh, the, the foremost examples are chlamydia gonorrhea, group B strep, and also Trichomonas vaginalis, or TV. This market has some things going for it. Uh, they are predominantly performed in the developed world, and the molecular forms of common SDI tests have already proven to be competitive in certain areas in terms of cost, and also highly superior in terms of time to results and accuracy over the conventional alternatives. Outpatient clinics already represent uh, significant clients for certain companies that are and that these are clinics that are performing the tests uh, in clinic or with relatively short times of response so that they can intervene with patients. Concluding, there are definitely uh, revenue opportunities available in the near term in women's health and STIs. Uh, particularly looking at chlamydia and gonorrhea multiplex testing that is offered on a molecular POC device. Uh, for specifics on this market opportunity, um, you can find those in Calorama information, the market and potential for molecular point of care diagnostics. These target segments and others can be compared and stacked up against each other using the data available in the report. Of course, molecular POC diagnostics is only one facet and far from the most revolutionary part of the greater field of clinical molecular diagnostics. The pace of innovation in molecular diagnostics, as Bruce has mentioned, has far outstripped both the development of regulator standards and payer protocols for reimbursement and test coverage. In particular, Next generation sequencing has been a challenge for regulators. One of the major applications of NGS in clinical diagnostics is in the field of oncology. And only there recently has the Obama administration began to reform and modernize the review of new therapies in cancer treatment 
along with their respective companion diagnostics. Can we move to the next slide, please? Instead of waiting on regulatory standards for NGS assay review or committing uh, substantial costs to clinical trials, some IVD vendors and many labs have proceeded to introduce new diagnostics as lab-developed tests, or LDTs. These are proprietary testing services. Without a currently viable path or easy one to introducing a sequencing assay, companies such as Illumina have commented that they are um, unlikely to introduce products as IVDs until the FDA begins to more closely regulate LDTs as it is their intention in the coming years. This is changing though and regulation could be a more be less of a barrier or a hindrance um, especially when looking at one recent development and that has been the FDA's new priority in advancing cancer therapies. And part of that was its recent July 2016 draft guidances for next generation sequencing. These guidances treated cr critical areas such as the use of standards for NGS tests and also the use of public genetic variant databases to support the clinical validity of these tests. And this is important as the U.S in some aspects lags behind other markets in terms of clinically approved NGS assay kits. In Europe, there are already CE-marked NGS cancer assays, and the China FDA has taken a stronger approach and has already imposed regulatory and clinical approval requirements for non-invasive prenatal tests and cancer NGS assays. In China, um, hospitals and independent labs are required to use CFDA approved tests and test kits. A key point of, regula of regulator and industry collaboration in advanced molecular diagnostics has been in the area of companion diagnostics, uh, certainly in oncology. Uh, one critical provision of the recently announced Moonshot Initiative, uh, also related to the administration's Precision Medicine Initiative, has been the establishment of a virtual oncology center of excellence. The center is the latest in a series of reorganizations of the FDA's review of cancer therapies. The previous iteration was the Office of Hematology and Oncology Products created in 2005 and that consolidated the review of cancer therapeutics. The office was later reorganized into disease-specific teams in 2011, and in some cases that short, shortened the window of review for therapies. Now under the Center of Oncology Excellence, companion assays can be reviewed and approved alongside their cancer therapeutics. And in the chart in this slide, you can see uh, some selected entries of the current pipeline of molecular companion diagnostics, and that includes several assays that we believe uh, stand to benefit from review by a virtual oncology center of excellence. Some that are closest to the market include Foundation Medicine's Brachness sequencing test, and that would be used with a PARP inhibitor, or drugs that target a mutation in the BRCA gene or another tumor gene related to DNA repair deficiencies. This test is currently approved, uh, preparing for pre-market approval. Another one close to the market undergoing preparation for pre-market approval is Illumina's sequencing companion assay, and that would be used with the Amgen drug uh, Vectabix. Sequencing assays are common in the companion diagnostic pipeline and for them to advance, they will definitely need better standards in terms of regulatory review. The other technologies represented in the pipeline include microarrays and more conventional qPCR assays. 
So in light of the provisions of the Moonshot Initiative, as well as the more proactive tack that the FDA is taking with next generation sequencing and other advanced diagnostic technologies, we believe there is strong potential for the development of sequencing within the US IVD market. And with the sale of assay kits to more clinical labs in the US, we believe there's a much larger potential market size, obviously, than restricting it to labs that are licensed to perform an LDT. I'm now going to hand it back over to Bruce to conclude the presentation, and then we will begin to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Emil. And um, I note that you have the ability to ask questions uh, using the, the bar that is on your screen as part of our uh, webinar software. So uh, please go ahead and ask questions. We have a couple, and um, we'll address in a, uh, in a second. I did want to point out, we've been talking about a lot of topics today, and in some cases a little general bird's eye view, some cases more detail. You could take the state of the IVD market and look at 27 different areas in detail. That's how much is going on, and it's not possible in, in, in a format like this, of course. So I want to point out our Knowledge Center tool. What is it? It's basically all of Calorama Information's public, published research studies. So we counted at 50,000 pages going back almost uh, 20 years, insights and analysis, of course, a lot of relevant content from the past three to four years, publishing on many of these topics. Lots of information on company revenues, partnerships, mergers and acquisitions. This way you can search for the information when you're doing your business planning. We have some uh, very, uh, you know, it's, it's a, the idea of the Knowledge Center is that if you're doing a lot of individual report purchasing for your organization and putting that on uh, your internet global license, that this could be a solution where you can have your employees have access to all of Calorama information's public research studies so it's available when you need it and not going through the purchase every time uh, that you need information. So, there will be information presented to you after this webinar, and our sales representatives will be delighted to help you uh, find a solution that fits your needs best. One of the questions that we received, and it's a, it's a fairly common one, is why do your estimates differ from other forecasts that we have seen on the web for the in vitro diagnostics market? There's a number of reasons for that. Every, all of these are estimates, analyst estimates. Uh, there's a variety of ways. We are very strong on the methodology of teasing out what we can from annual reports. We have a long history, and our analyst that writes this report is a long, several decades of covering the in vitro diagnostics market and learning how companies write about revenues in order to extract the right information. One of the things we feel sometimes you will see in other estimates is a tendency towards a higher number rather than a conservative one. A tendency sometimes to mix clinical and research and where we're trying to separate out the clinical diagnostics information and also sometimes you will see services mix and so that could be double counting because now you're counting both the reagent and the service that use the reagent. So we try to avoid all that in our month-long, several month-long analysis that goes into our 10th edition in vitro diagnostics product. Um, a, another question that um, I received here, and again, you know, we, we have a little bit of time, so if you, if you do have a question, go ahead and uh, type it into that, uh, that box on your screen, and, uh, and we'll try to address where we can is just that, uh, uh, Bruce, you know, you focused a lot on the uh, four companies and the 46%, and uh, really can you expand a bit on that. And, and certainly, I think that uh, 
to present the IVD market, uh, I mean, obviously you have to talk about those concerns because they're going to uh, they're going to impact a large pound, a large amount of the addressable uh, revenue. But the other way to look at it, of course, is that there's over 30 billion dollars in revenue that are not those four companies. So there's obviously lots of opportunity in the market. This is a market of innovation. A couple companies that. I have on my radar that we didn't mention there. Um, here's a couple you could call up and comers. Uh, watch Dexcom and their glucose product. Watch Nanostring and their gene signature assays. I point those out because their growth rates on our charts in the 10th edition are exceeding others in that kind of next tier of IVD companies. So those are two companies to watch. Now, the next company I'm going to mention is certainly not an up-and-comer, but it's, I wouldn't, I would keep an eye on orthoclinical diagnostics. You know, we met with them at AACC. One of the things they pointed out is they hired a large group of employees using on their customer service in particular. They believe their product development is starting to get there. Emil talked about some of the systems that they have. Uh, we have them as the 10th position in the IVD market. But it's much higher when you get into blood typing. They're, they're leading that market. When you get into clinical chemistry, they're in top five. So they're focused on cores. They're not going into every new test area. But it's something to watch. I think, I think a lot of people looked at them and said, look, they were spun off from J&J &J and, and the Carlo Group. And are they, are they doing anything? Are they growing? Or is it going to be packaged for another sale? And I think that our meeting, you know, I, to present their side of it, I think it, it's, it's interesting to watch when you look at the, the number of employees, um, several, uh, almost 2,000 employees hired since the J&J &J divestiture so the, and product development during that time. So that's not a company that's, um, that, that you know, that's not a company that's simply waiting for something to happen there. They'd argue they're more independent now. Uh, so just a company to watch. Of course, your service companies, Arup, Quest, watch what they're doing. This is going to provide the dynamism of the market. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, there's much more than just Roche, Siemens, Abbott, and uh, Danaher, Beckman, Coulter, of course. And uh, Emil, do you have a, uh, a question that you wanted to take on there? Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for submitting their questions, and we'll do our best to get back to you if we can after the call. Uh, going over one of them, uh, they were asking, can you give a understanding of the STD clinical market size compared to small hospitals? Uh, I believe he's referring to molecular POC diagnostics in particular. In a, uh, that would be something that would, would be addressed in the report. To get a better understanding of that, you have to understand the dynamics uh, within each test market. For something like chlamydia and gonorrhea, yes, that will be something that would be tested at the hospital, uh, especially in a maternity ward. However, that has a very strong component of uh, sexual health screening. Um, another area, a group B strep, that would be something that you would see m more representation in a hospital uh, uh, decentralized point of testing as that would be a very a severe neonatal infection. So it is complex. Um, it's something that we do discuss in the report and how the hospital or decentralized uh, hospital demand compares to the um, demand that's coming out of outpatient clinics. There was another um, question. Thank you, Emil. Uh, no, of course. Oh, you have another question. Great, great. Um, are we doing OK on time? I believe we can take one more here. I think we have a, a, a we, we could take another question, uh, just so that we, we, we try to address as much as we can. But uh, we'll try to conclude in a few minutes. Sure, of course. Uh, so I asked if you could comment on the trend of symptomatic testing instead of traditional target-based testing. What will happen going forward in your point of view? Uh, you are seeing more symptomatic panels being introduced to the market, especially with the great, um, greater sophistication and understanding in molecular uh, diagnostics. 
Um, a good example would be the film array. Uh, that would be something I would consider a symptomatic panel. Uh, the concern with that going forward would be the high cost of such a panel, um, but that would be something that would be justified in cases of bloodstream infections or sepsis. Great. Uh, another one to take quickly as we conclude is we were asked about China's economy. And yes, well, it's not a slowdown necessarily in the Chinese overall economy. There's been a slowdown in growth in the economy. Is that concerning for the IVD market? We are, we are still positive. Um, we have it at 14 to 15% growth next five years. No reason to change that. Uh, breakneck expansion might have tempered. But underlying characteristics are still there. Big population, need for health care, government support. It is still the best opportunity of the emerging. We, we really consider it emerge, but still the best of the emerging nations, if you will. Uh, any commentary on that, uh, Emil? Uh, I believe, or I think it's understood that uh, even with declining growth in China, that their healthcare sector, as in the case in other countries, including our country here in the United States, that the healthcare sector can outperform the larger macro economy. Um, that this is a country, a middle-income country. Um, uh, many middle-income countries have put an emphasis on healthcare as they are looking to remain more competitive in the global economy and attracting talent and to also provide uh, uh, better services to their citizens. Um, this China, of course, is going to remain a major target uh, since it has appreciable size looking at the global IVD market and will offer uh, growth rates uh, well above uh, Europe and um, to a lesser extent the United States. Great. Um, another question we received, do we include test service revenues? Do we include, uh, say, genomic health Singulex in our IVD estimate? The answer is we don't. However, in all of our reporting, we consider it. So we'll provide those revenues. We'll tell you what those companies are doing in the service end. They're not included in our $60.5 billion, the, the money they're earning performing tests. Uh, how will uh, retail clinics affect core lab volume, probably uh, central lab volume, probably not something that we could get into. We do plan a, this is a good time to say, we do plan a webinar on retail clinics coming up soon, and we'll definitely let you know about it. The plan is for October, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And uh, we'll definitely have more information. What I do know about retail clinics and the reason we included it is big growth in five years, and big interest from IVD vendors. It's uh, no novelty anymore. With that, uh, we will conclude Calorama Information's webinar on the state of the IVD industry in 2016. On behalf of CaloramaInformation.com, on behalf of MarketResearch.com, on behalf of myself and Emil Salazar, I really want to thank you for attending, for showing your interest. You can download this presentation later. And we'll also be in touch about uh, ways that we may be able to assist you. And thanks very much for attending. This will conclude the webinar.